Yes, very well. Okay, great. So European Space Program. So Etim reached out to me a few weeks back, uh, asking me to discuss the European space ecosystem and some of the ongoing programs, policies, structure, essentially what is going on in, the, in Europe and how does it relate uh, to the rest of the world. Um, so why am I qualified to speak about this? Actually, I've been active in the industry since <clears throat> the European industry since 2016. Um, so initially, I was working as a consultant for European space institutions and companies. So I actually worked quite closely with uh, some of the institutes that we'll be talking about today. This includes the European Commission, the European Space Agency, European GNSS Agency, although that's not been uh, renamed, as well as national space agencies such as the German Aerospace Center and also private space companies. Uh, so I've gotten a, a good chance to work with a lot of uh, big institutions and organizations across the industry, which has been quite nice. Um, that also meant essentially that I've got to be involved in quite a lot of cool projects um, across the entire space value chain. So on projects for the upstream, such as launchers, developing new types of rockets or space hardware to downstream projects that are more focused on market development. Um, so I've also worked with investment firms, uh, working on due diligences of companies that are about to be acquired. Um, and one of, actually one of the more publicized reports that I got to work on was for the European Investment Bank on the access to finance landscape in Europe. And uh, also quite recently, I worked on a project that was uh, EU response to COVID-19, leveraging satellite navigation, so GNSS uh, systems. Uh, so quite a lot of different types of experience all across the value chain. And uh, yeah, through that, I got a lot of experience within the European system. And so I'm able to share some of my knowledge uh, regarding that. What do I do currently? So currently I work, uh, create a company called Space Hubs Africa. So I don't work in the consulting industry anymore. I wanted to try and use a bit of my knowledge and my experience to see if I could help stimulate the African space ecosystem. So Space Hubs Africa is a platform uh, that is, or well, Space Hubs Africa is trying to build the online African ecosystem. So we have a platform uh, that allows users to learn about the space industry, to connect with others, uh, and eventually to get support to build their own uh, businesses and uh, space startups as they as they see fit. <clears throat> so looking ahead to this talk, and apologies for all the coughing, I seem to have picked up um, a bit of a cough overnight. Looking ahead to this talk, we'll be discussing four main aspects. So to set the stage, we'll first look at how space fits into the wider EU strategy and why it's a point of focus for them in the first place. Then we will look more concretely at how um, its space strategy is implemented, which institutions are involved. Um, and then we'll follow up with that with discussions about EU's flagship programs. So Galileo, EGNOS, Copernicus, Govs.com, and SSA. Don't worry if you've never heard of these terms before, we'll, we'll get into detail of them. I'm sure some of you have heard of them uh, though. And then lastly, we'll round out with a bit of discussion uh, about the cooperation between the EU and Africa um, within the space ecosystem. So to set the stage for European activity in space, um, looking back, we have to go back about 70 years to the Second World War. So post Second World War is when European nations or nations in general started looking to space as really a realm or an um, area where a lot of interesting things were happening and um, where a lot of cool technologies could be built. Most European countries, of course, were quite ravaged after the Second World War on all fronts. So economically, socially, obviously physically, a lot of a high death toll. Um, while the US and the Soviet Union ultimately actually came out as the winners, they weren't as damaged as Europe itself. And actually those two nations, the US and the Soviet Union, ended up starting off the Cold War, which was obviously very um, military driven and actually was what spurred the, the growth of the space industry. So the growth of rocket launcher technology and eventually satellites as well. Now, European scientists who wanted to be involved in the space industry or who, were, who had the technical knowledge for to develop uh, satellites and missiles, they had to actually look elsewhere to find jobs. So there weren't at that time many jobs on the continent itself, leading to a great, a great brain drain on the continent. Um, so actually, in fact, an uh, interesting history fact, the US actually um, signed up a lot of Nazi, Nazi scientists, which who, uh, who ended up becoming essentially the, the key scientists that formed NASA. So, I mean, we think a lot about um, 
European scientists moving over, it wasn't just the allied nations. It was also actually German Nazi scientists who had proven themselves to be quite resourceful, who the US snapped up, brought into NASA and helped actually move NASA's um, research and development team forward quite, um, quite dramatically actually. So the decade pretty much after the European scientists are leaving, European nations realized, okay, if we actually want to compete with these world power, superpowers, we need to figure out what we can do. And this was individual European nations. You had your Germany's, your France's, your England, all thinking this, which is why they decided to band together, actually, to be able to compete with the US and the uh, Soviet Union, which was significantly far ahead. Um, so remember, actually, at this time, the European countries were still acting individually. It would actually take another eight years or so before the Treaty of Rome, which was signed, which effectively is what created the European Union itself. And then fast forward uh, a decade to 1962, the first space agency started being created. So the European Launch Development Organization, um, as well as the European Space Research Organization, so ALDO and ESRO. A decade later from that point, these two agencies merged to actually create the European Space Agency as we know it right now, where there are 10 founding members. After that, the, I mean, during this period of time, obviously a lot of satellite missions were being launched by the Europeans. So a lot of these space missions are all about research, research and development, space science, earth science. And it, um, it really took until 2007 before a common European space policy and European space framework was created. It's actually the first thing that unified the European Space Agency with European uh, Union member states, creating the first political framework for space activities in Europe. So what were the key, the key issues or the key criteria or the key factors, key points of uh, contention for the European Space Agency back then? There were essentially three, three main themes, three main foundational areas that have come to underpin European space policies about and the European Space Agency tries to do. If we look at Annex 1, so the, the key issues here is focusing on developing a proper structure to ensure the efficient implementation of their projects from a user perspective, as well from a funding perspective, and also trying to address this question of ownership. Of course, when you have several member states involved in something, it does get a bit tricky in terms of who owns what, how does everybody get remunerated, and what is the benefit of being a part of this organization. Annex 2 basically talks about creating and sustaining a market for space data and applications. So by making it accessible and supporting it as well through funding and public procurement while Annex 3 actually starts talking about building an international market for European space products and services to make sure that um, the market for their services keeps growing, ultimately strengthening European technology. And as we see in the last bullet point of Annex 3, um, one of the key goals was to make full use of the potential of space systems for sustainable development, namely in support of developing countries, in particular Africa. Obviously, we know Africa is not a country, um, but to the rest of the world, sometimes it's, it's viewed that way. But we can see that Africa was on their mind already since the start. So this is quite some time ago. Now, this graphic is uh, unfortunately a bit blurry, but I think it highlights the main areas that the European Space Agency is looking at, or in general, European space. So that's about support, having the critical mission operations infrastructure on the ground. So having the necessary ground, straight, uh, ground stations, communication devices to enable um, satellite missions in the first place. In terms of the application areas, it's in navigation, earth observation, telecommunications, science, exploration, as well as now more recently, space safety and security. So that's becoming something that's, that's have, um, give you a bit of time just to look at this graphic in case anyone's reading. But what this basically means is that in this day and age, especially um, the present day, space is extremely relevant for the European Union. And the European Union has a very strong industry. So actually over a third of satellites that are manufact uh, manufactured globally are manufactured in Europe. So Europe has a very strong manufacturing and industrial base. Obviously, as we talked the, in the first uh, quiz, more than 30, uh, the EU owns more than 30 satellites. These are specifically under the Copernicus program, the Galileo program, uh, so for Earth observation and for GNSS, so na satellite navigation. EU investment in space has been rising quite consistently. Now it's close to 15 billion euros for the next, uh, the next defined period. 
<clears throat> so when you think about investment, they usually think about a span of years, the budget. So for this, uh, the current budget is from 2021 to 2027. Um, the European space industry is actually the second largest uh, space industry in the world. And it supports about 250,000 plus jobs. So if we compare this to Africa, I think Africa is around 10,000 uh, jobs supported or 10,000 employees within the industry itself, let alone jobs created or supported by the industry. So you can imagine the Europe is currently around like 25 times as big um, as the African ecosystem. And a big part of the EU is trying to make its uh, programs and its satellites and its data used by its citizens and also used internationally. So these are stats of the 2 billion Galileo enabled devices. That means that <clears throat> the satellite navigation system is actually being used as well as European earth observation companies actually using Copernicus data. So even though a lot of these EO earth observation companies have their own satellites and have their own data, they still end up using some of Copernicus data to cover the gaps uh, in their own constellations. Now, this is a very important point for Europe because what, how they think about it is really about socioeconomic benefits. You know, if we launch a satellite, what kind of benefits do we get to the economy? Obviously, you get um, direct economic benefits. So let's say you have a satellite that's monitoring an area uh, and in Earth observation, you get the direct economic benefit of being able to improve any kind of system. So if you're in agriculture, you can have uh, more precise agriculture um, farming, you can have more intelligent data that allows you to um, basically uh, manage your fields and manage your crops. You have indirect benefits that come due to the um, incre uh, increase in jobs. So if you're a farmer and you hire two or three other uh, employees, that's an indirect benefit of um, European space because now you're able to have more efficient farms and you're still able to spread the, the uh, benefits of the technology further and further. So one way that Europe, uh, Europe thinks about it is in terms of taxes, every, every euro, so every one euro that is spent within the space sector actually generates an additional six euros in societal benefits. But from that, it's quite easy to understand why both public and private institutions are developing space enabled application because ultimately they help reduce the cost they improve the individual lives of citizens, and they also enable public authorities to make policy decisions, right? So a lot of times, so now space data in general is used in basically every facet of the European industry. And the applications are quite wide ranging and important both from societal and geopolitical aspects, um, taking into account, of course, the security of the union as a whole. So on a, thinking about the context of um, Europe with regards to the rest of the world. Because when, the Euro when Europe is in general thinking about how to go about defining its space systems, defining its space programs and policies, it has to do it uh, in the complex international context. So they're both geopolitical and economic considerations for the union. So the importance really is uh, creating a secure EU, which is very uh, relevant, of course, considering our current global context, current pandemics. Um, I think it's quite, I think it's fairly clear to all of us that we do live in quite an uncertain time. And this is more so the case when you consider things from a European perspective, right? So looking at the US, even though Trump has left, the EU-US relationship has, hasn't quite normalized, it's still contentious. And if you look at the recent Afghanistan situation, you can see that there's problems with the cooperation. Uh, looking at the borders of the EU, so with Russia and near the, the east, there are a lot of crises that are taking um, place outside of the EU, but that are resulting in situations such as increased migration or more refugees, which ends up impacting the union's security um, and the union's ability to take care of its own citizens. Similarly, on the economic side, there are a lot of impacts that are coming up. I mean, we all know about COVID-19. That's caused different supply chain shocks. We're talking about technology dependence, emerging technologies. A lot of different factors are coming together uh, right now that the EU has to take, um, take, a, take note of and account for when developing its own strategy, when developing what to do next. So all in all, there's essentially a, a need for strategic autonomy um, and technology sovereignty in order to protect the union's economic security and competitiveness. And this is um, quite well demonstrated or seen um, in various news clippings um that that highlights essentially the problem that the eu has in front of it right so this is the frame rate that the eu that europe uses when creating its own space strategy when creating its policies when thinking about what to focus on 
these are sort of the issues that it's uh, that it has on its mind, right? Now we've essentially set the stage for the European Union uh, in the world, and we've also provided a bit of context with which the Euro Union has developed the strategy. So emerging post-World War II, Europe managed to unite and create a space ecosystem that brought tremendous amount of value to the European Union and has now made them one of the premier players in today's space industry. How did they do it? And so it actually may be instructive to first start off with the, the European Union as a whole. How is it structured? What does the governance look like? You know, how does this uh, complex uh, system work together? So, I mean, some of you may know this, some of you may not, <clears throat> but essentially the European Union was established with the treaties of Rome in 1958. So the EU is essentially both a political project as well as a form of legal organization. And that makes it a bit tricky in some respects, but essentially European governance is based on a few principles. So opening up um, and transparency of EU institutions, involving civil society into decision-making, framing and in, uh, implementing consistent and well-managed policies, ensuring a clear, stable, and predictable regulatory framework to support growth and jobs, um, respecting the principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. So not every member state is obviously the same size, but they should still receive a proportional return from their involvement in the European Union, as well as making sure that each of the EU institutions and member states explain and take responsibility for what they do within the EU to contribute to global governance. So the main arm of the EU European Union is the European Commission. So that's where a lot of the um, coordination comes from. That's where a lot of the um, management in general comes from. And a lot of the funding also comes from that. So they provide directives and regulations to the member states. So that's what you see at the top of this. Um, and the member states just report their actions to the European Commission. So they're sort of an overseeing body for the member states. They then, the European Commission, then reports their... Um, their actions, both to the parliament and to the council of the European Union. The parliament is more there just to supervise and improve while the council of the European Union actually proposes new actions for the European commission. So you have this four body system where the member states follow the direction of the European commission and the European commission is essentially monitored by the council and the parliament. Now, when thinking about you, the EU space strategy, right? Obviously we have to understand what are the priorities of the European Union in the first place. The main priority of the European Union is to assert itself geopolitically. That's something we mentioned, I mentioned a little bit earlier. The EU looks at its competitors as the US, China and Russia and wants to be strong geopolitically and have a say and influence geopolitically. That's one bar of it. The other bar is to also be secure, right? To have a secure union. So you both need a strong internal industry with secure and independent access to space and its space components, as well as a foreign policy that is based on promoting adoption of European space programs to basically tap into other markets as mentioned. And as a result, that leaves you with international comp competitiveness and economic diplomacy as two important tools that the EU regularly uses um, to basically define its strategy, right? What we're seeing or what happened actually quite recently is that we're seeing European space programs becoming more unified. So actually um, earlier this year, I think it was this year, I think it was March, I think it was March, uh, March this year, or it might've been last year, uh, but essentially they've adopted a new European space program for the years 2021 to 2027, for the first time establishing a single space program on a single legal basis. So in search of the goal of like making the EU stronger, the EU has made steps to unify more of its space programs to have a more simplified and clear approach to space because it was, a little, it was even more convoluted uh, pr previously. So the European space policy then sets out a basic vision. So this uh, single space program sets a vision um, for the space sector as a whole and tackles issues such as security and defense, access to space exploration. This was adopted by the Space Council of, the ESA, of ESA and EU ministers. And this approach is intended to equip Europe for space study and exploration going forward, right? So through this document, through this program, the EU, European Space Agency and its member states all commit to increasing coordination of the activities and programs and organizing the roles around space. You know, the new EU space program was designed to fit the political priorities of the new European Commission commissioner. So Ursula von der Leyen, she took office in December, 2019. So two years back. And she defined specific political priorities for the European Union. 
she defined actually six priorities. I've only listed four because only four of them are relevant uh, for the European space program. So the European Green Deal, so think about climate change, a Europe fit for digital age. So in terms of transforming um, infrastructure to become more technological, promoting a European way of life. So making, <clears throat> making sure to secure internal priorities as well as a stronger Europe in the world. So thinking outwardly, how does Europe reflect against its competitors, right? So anytime you think about what the EU strategy is, the EU is always trying to improve its standing versus other geopolitical powers such as the US and Russia. And so that's how that's the frame of mind it thinks about. So in terms about protecting the security of European Union members, as well as projecting strength outwardly to other competitors, right? And so thinking about the EU Green Deal and how satellite-based technologies can be useful for that in terms of increasing efficiency in agriculture and fisheries. So using satellite-enabled applications to improve mapping, let's say, of uh, cropland, harvesting. Um, this all guarantees better food and food quality and security, which helps safeguard the environment as well, right? It wants to help regions access knowledge and information. So satellite support communication when Earth-based solutions are limited. This reduces regional imbalances across the, the union by serving communities in remote areas with no internet access. And this also helps improve crisis response. So using satellite services to shorten the response time in emergencies. Um, and essentially using satellite-based technologies to, to try and address each of the main political priorities, right? I'm sure you can think of different ways that satellites can help. For example, in optimizing transport, you know, you have satellite navigation systems combined with enhanced communication. This allows you to have a very highly accurate uh, satellite positioning and helps to contribute to a more modern transport sector for cars, planes, ships, drones, fleet management, all of these aspects. Now, looking at the structure of the European Space Program, right? It is first important to understand that actually the European Space Agency is not an agency of the European Union. Is an agency of Europe, but not an agency of the European Union. This means essentially that there are several non-EU members that are part of the European Space Agency. Of course, more recently, UK became one of those. But even before that, Canada. Canada is a part of the European Space Agency. It actually cooperates with the European Space Agency quite regularly. And there are a lot of non-EU countries that are also part of the European Space Agency. Right. So this is the case, even though the EU and its member states are around 86%. So they fund actually 86% of what the European Space Agency does. But since there are other non-EU members in it, this makes things quite difficult. Why does it make it quite difficult? Well, the initial aim of the European Union, right, was to make the European Space Agency an actual official agency of the EU. So this was an initial plan that was supposed to be implemented before 2014. But because ESA has non-EU members in it, they strongly, strongly refuse this. And this was actually a big contentious point within the European, uh, within Europe, as to how to actually split this, who owns what. Because already, already you already have coordination problems between the European Space Agency and the European Union. They come together, right, because they have a common aim, which is to strengthen Europe as a whole and benefit its citizens. And they actually partner with each other on different flagship space programs. So if you see at the bottom, Galileo, Egnos, Copernicus, these are all European space programs where both the European Space Agency and the European Union come together to work on, right? So the European Space Agency typically provides technical oversight, so technical management, uh, developing the satellites, having the ground stations, while the European Union, so European Commission, typically was more about operations and also market development, right? And so actually, it was actually, so we talked about um, here about the European Space Agency, so Joseph Asprasha and Thierry Breton from the European Commission coming together to finally create this new streamlined space program. The European Commission would have hoped that they, that space program would have included European Space Agency as a European institution, but that was a huge fight between both ESA and the EU. And it only came, so in January 20, 2021, after years of really acrimonious relations, so they really like head to head, didn't like each other, they finally mended their, uh, their relationship and decided, okay, European space policy will continue to rely on ESA as an independent institution, so we'll leverage ESA's technical expertise and science expertise, but the ESA will continue to be its own European space agency, not part of the EU, right? 
And so they decided to work together rather than trying to assimilate ESA into, into Europe. So that was actually a big fight that has been going on for, for quite some time, quite some years, which had influenced a lot of the cooperation on the lower level. Um, but now they said, okay, ESA is completely separate, but what we're going to create instead is OISPA, so the European Union Agency for the Space Program. So OISPA used to be the European GNSS Agency, so a European Agency for Satellite Navigation, which had a very specific and not, uh, yeah, very specific role. Now it's been renamed, remodeled to the European Space Agency, the European Agency, European Agency for the Space Program. Very annoying name. But yeah, you have the OISPA, European Agency for the Space Program, and you have ESA, European Space Agency, which are two separate entities um, that are both working to improve European space capabilities, right? So they are, now have very distinct roles. So ESA is very technical, OISPA is very operational, and they work together to try and uh, keep things going. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we'll get into a bit. We'll get into it a bit more. Um, but yeah, the main thing to realize is that ESA is not really an EU organization. So aside from these two main organizations now, you also have other actors that are involved in different aspects of the space program. So whether it's Copernicus or whether it's Galileo or whether it's the GovSatcom, each, each flagship space component on the bottom has different actors that come in uh, on a, <clears throat> a need-to need basis, essentially, helping the operational and technical management of these different space components. So Galileo and Egnos are the satellite navigation components. So that's around 9 billion has been mapped out for the next uh, six years for those programs. Copernicus, Earth observation, 5 billion around, and then two new components. So these are new created for this space program, which is SSA, so space security awareness, and GovSatcom, which is about governmental, so secure governmental satellite communication, right? So a lot of different actors, a lot of different space components. This is this is the streamlined version. Before this, it was a lot more complex, a lot more different lines to draw, but now it's been simplified somewhat. Just give you a few seconds on the slide and then we will move on. So OISPA, the European Union Agency for the Space Program. Not a very nice name, <laughs> but essentially, the European GNSS Agency is what was expanded to create OISPA. So the European GNSS Agency was actually based in Prague, in Czech, in the Czech Republic. You see at the bottom right, that's actually the building, the European Global Navigation Satellite Systems Agency. It's actually an agency I'm quite familiar with. So I did a lot of my work as a consultant in Europe. I actually worked quite closely with the GSA on a lot of different projects. Uh, so the EU response to COVID that I talked about at the very, very start was actually implemented by the European uh, Global Navigation Satellite Systems Agency, so GSA. So this whole story for OISPA GSA basically started in 2002. So um, <clears throat> the European Space Agency and the European community came together to decide to develop what is now known as Galileo. So the Galileo program, so it's independent satellite navigation system, independent to GPS. Everybody knows GPS, the US started it from a military perspective and ended up being something that could be used globally by anybody to secure independent access. So for the security of the European Union, Europe decided we need to have our own satellite navigation system that's independent. So if anything happens to GPS, we're not, you know, we're not damaged by it. We're not affected by, by it. You know, we have control over our own system. We can be independent. We can do what we want. And we have a more secure system because of that, right? So in 2002, that's sort of the discussions about Galileo came, up, uh, came about. And then two years later, the GSA was uh, formed. And now, you know, a few years later, OISPA is taking over. That makes sense. I think that should be relatively clear. So looking at the structure, the governance structure of OISPA, what does it, uh, how does it look? So OISPA, European Union Agency for the Space Program has four main tasks. One um, is operational security of the Galileo segment. So the two space components we talked about, EGNOS and Galileo, those are the satellite navigation systems. We'll talk a bit more about them later down on this, uh, this talk, but EGNOS is a satellite-based augmentation system. Galileo is the European version of GPS, essentially. That, so we can think about like, what did the GSA used to do before and what's different? The GSA was involved with the operational security of the Galileo systems, as well as this monitoring section on the left. So anything to do with Galileo, making sure you can uh, monitor the system, operate the system. That was all the GSA, the European GNSS Agency. 
Now, to make it the European space, the European Agency for the Space Program, they've added two new um, parts to it, the security ac accreditation and coordination of the two new systems, SSA and govs.com. So security accreditation essentially basically means that um, to make sure that all the components of the European space programs are done in a secure manner. So they're responsible for the provision of the service, making sure you have the right uptimes, things are running launch uh, properly, approving satellite launches, operating systems in different configurations, and operating the ground stations as well. While the coordination of the two new programs is more about yeah, overall coordination, overall management of the systems. We'll talk about it as mentioned a bit uh, later down the line. But that essentially covers OISPA's new um, responsibilities and what they do in the ecosystem. So as mentioned, they were officially formed this year in May 2021, based in Czech Republic, and have a budget of about 6.5 billion in 2021 itself. Now, coming back to ESA, as mentioned, ESA is not a European agency, but it's an intergovernmental, it's an intergovernmental organization of 22 member states. So the European Union is 27 member states. ESA is 22, only has 22 of those 27 member states as well as having other states like the UK um, and like Canada. And so thinking, we talked a bit about the history of European space. So it was really after, in 19, around 1958, the Treaty of Rome decided to meet together and create a European space agency because they realized that they were far too far off the pace from um, both the US and Russia. And so that's how it actually started without being a European organization because ESA was actually technically created before the EU was really a thing. And it was a independent collaboration of different European states who came together to create ESA. Um, as we talked about, it was, a, it was a merger of the European Launch and Development Organization and the European Space Research Organization, which came together um, in 1970s uh, to form ESA. So by this time, they'd already launched quite a few satellites um, before it actually became ESA itself. So how does ESA actually run? You know, ESA is essentially defined by two main organs. So you have the council, the ESA council, and you have the director general. So the ESA council is the organ that represents the member states. So it meets by itself. It has its own ministerial and de delegate level. It meets by itself and it, appoint, and, um, it appoints the director general who represents the agency then itself, so directly. So like I said, European, European ecosystem is quite complex. There's a lot of different moving parts. This is, a, this is even a simplified version of how things run. Um, but essentially there's two aspects to it. There's the council and there's the director general. And the council um, essentially is a ministry of ESA member states, which meet every two to three years to define the policy at a ministerial level. And then the director general is more sort of the day-to-day -day operational um, level. I'll give you a bit of time to read the slide because it has a bit more information. Essentially, member states have one vote. They're represented by a delegation um, composed of two people. They only have the right to vote on matters um, that are exclusively part of the programs that they're part of. Um, and the council itself has different subordinate bodies that are helping the council manage itself. So it has committees, boards, takes recommendations from different areas. There are a lot of delegates, a lot of committees, a lot of experts. It's very complex. I'm trying to simple, um, simplify it um, as much as possible. So what does that look like? Uh, graphically, essentially, ESA and EU are the green states, ESA only, red states, EU only, blue states, not including Canada. So looking at the time, I'll try and speed things up a bit. So to respect you guys' time, European, so ESA itself is then formed by different components. We talked about it slightly earlier, all based in different areas. So you have ESTEC, the European, the ESA Space Research and uh, Technology Center, which is the largest site and is the technical heart of ESA. So most of the technical aspects come from ESTEC in the Netherlands. So more than 2000 specialists work there on the, the dozens of space projects. <clears throat> so except for launchers, except for the rocket launcher technology, everything is basically based in ESTEC in Nordvik. ESOC, a uh, ESA Space Operations Center, that's the mission control center for the European Space Agency located in Darmstadt in Germany. Oops. EAC, your, uh, EU Astronaut Son uh, Center, also located in Germany. Same as S-Track, so the European Space uh, Tracking Network. EXAT is a very new thing that was created. So this was, this was created actually to try and improve relations with the UK, which is why it's based in Harwell in the UK. 
ESAC, European Space Astronomy Center, is based in Madrid. Um, ESA Center for <coughs> Earth Observation, also called ESRIN now, um, is based in Italy. And then you have the actual Guyana Space Center itself, which is based uh, in Guyana. So not even in Europe, but uh, a bit outside. Um, yeah, so these are, these are all the different, basically the different bodies of the um, of ESA, which all are responsible for different aspects of um, ESA's operations, essentially. Give you a bit of time just to look at the pretty pictures. So I, I've personally only been to, I've been to ESOC and the EAC, but I haven't managed to go to any of these other, other institutions, unfortunately. Looking at the budgets, so most of ESA's money goes into Earth observation, as we can see here, for 2021, about 1.5 bill, basically on the Earth observation aspect. So that's usually the Copernicus program. Space transportation talks about launchers, rocket launchers, and its necessary ground stations. That's the second largest, and then navigation with Galileo, and the rest is essentially space research um, and uh, other <clears throat> things like human space flights and uh, space exploration. Now, on average, EU citizens pay about four times less than in the, U, uh, in the USA in terms of the taxes that go to uh, the space agency. So ESA is funded from annual contributions by national governments, as well as an annual contribution by the EU itself. And every three to four years, uh, ESA member states come together to agree on a budget plan for the next few years, right? And ESA, ESA's activities are split into mandatory activities and optional activities. So the mandatory ones, um, everybody has to put their money in and actually has to fund it, while the uh, optional ones, each member state can decide themselves if they want to take part of it, and then they then fund it themselves. So, for example, the International Space Station and a lot of microgravity research are it's actually an optional program that each member state can decide themselves if they want to be a part of. And then looking more deeply into the budgets, you see which countries um, give the most. We talked about this earlier, so France with the highest percentage um, at 23%, Germany close second at 21%. And then um, you have other states like Italy, 13%, um, UK, 9%, and then the other, um, other member states. As mentioned, ESA also gets income not only from member states, but also from the European Union, as well as actually an independent um, organization called UMITSAT, the European Meteor Meteorological um, Association. And um, yeah, so each, each country generally has its own space program itself and its own space agency. And then they all meet together to then form the European Space Agency. So they, so they have to fund their own agency as well as the European Space Agency. So for example, France or with its CNES Space Agency, um, it actually paid, I think it was like 75% of its uh, funding went to the ESA while the other 25% went to CNES. You know, so that each country has to decide how much they give to each, um, to each thing. Looking at uh, some of the space missions, so this is just a highlighting to see what ESA actually does. It's really big into space research. So here's a lot of it's solar missions to study other planets, so studying Jupiter's moons, Mars, Venus. Um, it actually had, has had quite a lot of uh, missions over the past year. Some of these are still active, some of these are not, and some of these are new. And similarly, um, not only exploring different worlds, but also looking at our own solar system or our own Earth using different uh, frequencies. Right, so you have uh, the Pathfinder, which is all about gravitational waves. So that's quite new. You have things like um, Gaia, which is about surveying the solar system itself. So ESA is really, really focused on space research primarily. That's kind of its main focus. And we talked about other space agencies. So CLES uh, is the French uh, space agency, the Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales, based in Paris, France. Um, it's really big on security defense or so launcher systems as well. So access to space launcher systems, as well as some research while um, the German Aerospace Center is also big into research and more also into robotics. So the German Aerospace Center has like 30 different sites all across Germany. So it has really quite a lot. Um, and France only has four. So in Paris and Toulouse and also the French Guyana spaceport. <clears throat> so why does Germany have so much? This, Talking about going back to World War II, Germany always had a strong launch uh, capability, missile capability. In general, their science uh, was quite strong, where the Nazis had really great science. And so they were able to really um, build on it quite easily moving forward. Whoops. Similarly, the Italian Space Agency and the U UK Space Agency were two big agencies. 
Um, now the UK is not part of the EU anymore, but in any case, it was still one of the most relevant agencies uh, for ESA and also just for Europe as a whole. So looking more generally, whoops, go back. This is essentially how you can think about the structure of um, the European space ecosystem, right? So you have your member states, your EU and your ESA member states. These are these two work together to have these uh, programs. So the European Space Agency, ESA, you know, different space agencies as well. These are all the different actors on Europe that work together. They have to think about how, how they operate is basically based uh, built on different international relation dimensions. So political dialogues, economic diplomacy, interagency cooperation, as well as having international partners and agencies that they work with. It's a very complex system, a lot of different bodies, a lot of different ways of approaching, a lot of different agreements and regulations to think about, a lot of different structures that are all working together <clears throat> to create the European space ecosystem. Now that's a very complex topic. I'll try to slim it down as much as possible, but that wraps up that section. So now we'll get back to questions. Um, as mentioned before, Slido is the place for questions. So first question, is national contribution to hosting a center a factor in deciding the location of an ESA center, e.g. Estec in Netherlands? So no, because as we saw before, Netherlands, uh, we can actually go back um, a few slides. So here, the Netherlands um, actually only contributes less than 2% of ESA's budgets. So that was not really the reason for it. Netherlands, in general, is seen as quite a neutral destination. And also, it's um, based on corporate capabilities as well, and to, as in why they decide to hold centers there. Um, so it's not really because of national contribution. In fact, I think in this case, it's because um, Netherlands was seen as more of a neutral location. But yeah, how much you contribute does not really decide whether or not you get to host. What it does decide is how much return you get from uh, your investment. So ESA is based on a, a proportionality system. So essentially, how much you put in returns to you in contracts or procurement contracts to actually develop your own industry. What does that mean? So ESA basically, ESA and the European Commission have tenders and bids for gun contracts to develop different aspects of your space ecosystem that they then set out to all member states. So anybody from any member state can apply to fulfill the contract. And so the more a country puts into ESA, the more likely the, they have to get a proportional return in terms of the contracts that they actually, industrial contracts that they actually get to work on, which leads to other returns and profits and things like that. So when you have a strong regional block such as the EU, is there any value in having a national space agency or is that a duplication of effort? So as we talked about, every uh, member state in, in, in Europe has actually its own national space agency, <clears throat> but they all still contribute to the European Space Agency. So obviously some countries have bigger budgets than others. So countries like Germany and France, even though they still represent a large part of the ESA budget, they still have large national space budgets themselves. So this allows them to develop, to make sure that they're developing their own personal capabilities, to make sure they can focus on their own specific priorities without having to care what the ESA cares about. And also allows them to have, be a bit more synergistic in how they, what projects they decide to apply for with an ESA versus what they decide to do themselves. Um, smaller countries are less likely to have their own local ecosystem and then they would rather just give their money to ESA and have ESA coordinate and manage most of the things that are going on. <clears throat> How does space affect or determine geopolitical positioning? So now this is a pretty complex topic <laughs> all in all, um, but essentially most infrastructures that we think about today, most modern infrastructures are in some ways backed by space technologies. So I mean, think something as simple as GPS. So we talked about GPS and Galileo. So GPS is the global positioning system developed by uh, the US, which allows you to figure out where you are anywhere in the world, you know, you know, with your phone or with any kind of technology. If the European Union did not have Galileo, it would be 100% dependent on GPS for all of its positioning systems. So this, is, this affects also economy. So you think about companies that use uh, navigation system, you think about um, organizations such as uh, like national institutions, which as well uh, use uh, positioning systems of the military, for example. Now you have your entire like European military is based on American technology. So what does that mean? So if, if the US decided one day, like let's say the US and EU are fighting, are fighting a war, the US, the US just decides, okay, we will just turn off access to GPS for 
any European user. All of a sudden, European infrastructure is significantly damaged, significantly impacted by that decision, right? So a lot of the movements in space and a lot of the space components that they've developed is really about in, uh, securing independent access so to not be um, dependent on the US or Russia, Russia systems themselves because that weakens you geopolitically. So if you have your own independent system and your own structures and you're not dependent on any other country, that one from just a pure uh, sort of like military perspective, that's very beneficial. Second, well, which is also one of the big um, strategies for the EU is about international diplomacy, you know, economic diplomacy and actually using your technologies as a way to, um, to work with other nations and to strengthen your position vis-a-vis -vis your neighbors. So for example, in, in Africa, ESA in Europe is very, um, is doing a lot to try and promote the use of Galileo and Copernicus systems within Africa, because that stops then African countries from using US systems and so African countries are more dependent on European systems. And so that fosters a collaboration and actually deepens the tie between them to improve European systems, to improve European markets and to strengthen Europe from a geopolitical perspective. So hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. <clears throat> of course, there's other ways and other, other factors, but just broadly speaking, that's sort of uh, um, how, it's, how it's looked upon. So, Dieta Cho, how is space regulation in the EU organized? Is regulation centralized or is each member state having its own independent regulation? So, similar question, each, each member state usually has its own national space program and national space agency, which it does by itself, but any organization, any interaction with ESA, so the funding that goes to ESA and the ESA decisions are organized by ESA itself uh, through its council, through its direct regenerate. Then, what would have been the advantages or disadvantages either to EU or ESA if ESA was absolved into the EU? So uh, advantages for the EU would be that the EU now has complete control over every, um, all the entire space ecosystem, which means that now you don't have multiple entities that have to now coordinate with each other. You just have one entity that decides what happens in each block. So currently when the EU, so if the European Commission wants to do something, the ESA wants to do something, they have to meet, they have to talk, they have to deliberate, they have to debate back and forth. A lot of politi politics comes in, involved. And so that makes things more complex from a coordination and a communication standpoint, right? To have two separate entities. So if it was just one entity under the EU, coordination of the whole program would be much significantly easier for the European Union. But as we mentioned, other member states that are not part of the EU are part of ESA. So for countries like UK, for Canada, for Latvia, Lithuania, which are part of ESA, but not part of the EU, they lose autonomy. They lose the ability to direct um, or to organize and direct the, the future of the European Space Agency. And they are now more subservient to the EU as a whole. So for countries that are not part of the EU, but part of ESA, they don't want to lose that autonomy. They don't want to lose that ability to affect the future. And they don't want to be dependent on the EU. So those are some of the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of NUGMA2. If you have advantages is that you improve coordination, disadvantages that the um, nations that are not part of uh, ESA or of the EU lose their autonomy. Is GovSatcom considering countries that are outside of Europe? Uh, for the time being, no. So Gov GovSatcom is a very new program that's being still being developed right now. So not everything's not clear, but GovSatcom is meant to be specifically for European uh, nations to be able to securely communicate with each other uh, without interference. So this is specifically for European nations. It's a very private system, very secure system. Currently no plans uh, to offer it outside of Europe. Following Brexit, is UK still part of ESA? Also, how does the UK participate in the space programs of Europe? Following Brexit, yes, the UK is still part of ESA. So as mentioned, you don't have, you don't have to be part of the EU to be part of ESA. So the UK is still part of ESA. And it does pr participate in some of the space programs. So for example, it's UK is still quite heavily um, involved in Copernicus, which is the European um, Earth Observation System. So they still give quite a lot of funding to Copernicus and are involved in so, um, some of the other space research and some of the big space missions. But of course, UK's uh, involvement has, has reduced because now the UK also wants to spend more time developing its own national space program and its own national space agency a bit, a bit more independent of ESA. But yeah, UK is still part of ESA and it does still participate in space programs just in the regular way because ESA is different from the European Union. 
is the EO budget 23%? What is used for launching or is that a separate budget? So let's go quickly back to here. So this space transportation talks about the launchers. So that's about rocket launchers, ground station, anything that gets um, the satellites into space and anything that involves moving in space itself. So that's all covered by this one, um, uh, 1 billion euros uh, approximately. then what are some of the persistent challenges faced with ESA from its creation? So a big part of it is really the coordination. So now you have different, because you have several different member states that are all involved in this organization. And so a big challenge is always coordinating between the two, deciding what the new policies are going to be, deciding what the new priorities are going to be. All of those are big challenges that faces, um, faces ESA and faces any kind of big institution, because each nation has its own priorities, as mentioned, each nation has its own vision. And so trying to coordinate that is quite difficult. Um, similarly, ESA, ESA coordinating with the EU itself adds more challenges to it. So a lot of coordination issues, which is why this new recent law to simplify the space program, have a unified front, has helped or is, is hoping to help some of these challenges by creating very streamlined systems, OISPA, ESA, ESA is technical, OISPA is operational, and should be, it should be easier for the two to work together. The impact of European satellite systems. When we think about European space programs, we think of five programs. So you think of Copernicus, Galileo, EGNOS. The new ones are SSA and GovSatcom. So Copernicus is all about Earth observation. Galileo, satellite navigation. EGNOS, also satellite navigation. So it's a SPAS system. So it's a satellite-based augmentation system. So it improves regular navigation signals. SSA is now about space situation awareness. We'll talk about this. It's a very hot topic these days. Think about space debris and things like that. And GovSatcom, as I mentioned, secures satellite communications. So EGNOS is a satellite-based augmentation system, so known as SPAS. So this is a method of improving your regular navigation system's attributes. So satellite navigation, you have different satellites in, in orbit, signals coming in, and based on those signals and the time it takes for the signals to go to the ground and back, you can calculate um, and georeference a location. SPAS essentially improves your ability to do that by getting rid of the errors. So the errors in the signal going through the atmosphere, going to ground and coming back. By having EGNOS, you're able to have more reference points. So you're able to uh, run algorithms to improve the accuracy and reduce the noise in the satellite signal that you get. And there are many such systems in place globally. Um, EGNOS is just Europe's version of it, right? And so thinking about the sources of error, I think like clock, clock drift, Going through the atmosphere causes fluctuations in the signals. I mean, we have a lot of scientists in here, so I'm sure everybody or can think about different types of errors that can occur to signals, signals moving through space or moving through atmosphere. And EGNOS basically improves accuracy, improves integrity, and makes sure that people who are using the signals can be more can have more confidence in their position um, and uh, in the signals as a whole. And so this is very important for some um, international organizations like the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, which is basically um, the organization that, that uh, sets the regulations and sets the standards for air travel, for air for flights. So um, EGNOS, I mean, it just, it just improves satellite navigation systems so, so it can be used in things like um, precision farming, vehicle management, and different applications of it. In terms of how it's managed, like I mentioned, so ESA was really involved in the technical side, technical development and design. It's owned by the European Commission. So the transfer, the ownership moved from ESA to European Commission in 2009. And then you have other, um, uh, so you have other um, organizations like Eurocontrol, which actually run and deliver the services, but are managed by OISPA. So, so a small program, you can already see a lot of different players and a lot of different things going on. Three main services, open service, data access service, safety of life. Um, open service is something that's very common across all space programs, European space programs. It's really about um, letting these things be used free of charge, open by anybody in Europe or anybody who can add access to it. They can use it free of charge rather than to pay all across the world. So that's a very big uh, motto for, for European space programs. Then you have Galileo. So we talked about GPS. We talked about um, you know, why it's important for Europe to have its own independent system. You know, Galileo's Europe's GNSS, um, and it gives them an alternative, right? So European independence was the main goal behind creating Galileo. 
Um, so it allows Europe to basically be a part of the GNSS system. So you have uh, multiple different GNSS. So Russia has GLONASS, China has Baidu, uh, US has GPS. Um, all of these systems can actually work together. So they're interoperable. And so having access to all of them gives you a more accurate position. And um, Galileo essentially uses different frequencies than GPS. So funny enough, we're talking about you know, geopolitical uh, pressure, being independent. When Galileo was being developed, the US was very, very concerned about it at the start because it could have been a possible security threat for them. The initial design of Galileo was going to use the same frequencies as GPS, which means that if the US wanted to, let's say, um, um, essentially like if, if, if someone wanted to use Galileo to attack the U US, right? So I wanted to use my Galileo signals to do military strikes in the US. If the frequency was the same as GPS, the US would not be able to defend against it because the way to defend against it would be to jam the signal, the signal frequency. But if it does that, then it inadvertently affects GPS as well. So that was a big point of contention between the US and U EU, eventually leading to the EU deciding, okay, Galileo will have different frequencies so they'll operate completely separated from each other. And so neither uh, region will lose um, access or genesis capability with the other one being down. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't, I think it might have butchered a bit of the explanation. But essentially Galileo was um, launched or implemented or really like active in 2016. So it's actually quite a very new program. Um, there was like a, a test satellite was, was launched in 2011, but it's only been since 2016 that it's been actually operational. And it's not fully operational yet. So you see all these different services here, actually only um, the first three are, or actually the first two and search and rescue are currently in use. So open service, public, reg public regulated service and search and rescue are the main services that are currently being used. High accuracy, signal authentication and timing are going to come in the future uh, because Galileo is still quite new as mentioned, uh, but the market for satellite navigation service is quite huge, right? So it's, um, I think it's around 250 billion uh, euros per year. Um, around 7% of the EU economy is dependent on glo uh, global navigation satellite signals across multiple application areas, so in transport, logistics, telecommunications, energy. So it's, it's quickly become a very important uh, space program for the EU, right? And the EU wants to be on par with others, so on par with GLONASS, on par with Beidou, and on par with GPS, and strengthening the competitiveness of its own uh, system. And like different independent studies have shown that Galileo is projected to deliver around 90 billion euros of value to the EU European economy over the first 20 years of operation. So between now and essentially 20, uh, 20, 2036 or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that's become very, very quickly become a very important um, aspect of the European space ecosystem. And it's something that I continue to work on and continue to add more features on. As we see, European Commission is, has the overall responsibility, the technical development designs from ESA, Operations is from OISPA, but it's funded and owned by the EU and the member states um, as a whole. Once again, multiple different actors all working together to try and run a system. Can be good in some ways, can be can cause coordination difficulties in other ways. And as we're talking about, the, the next step is to bring the new version of Galileo so to improve the technology of it. Um, the first constellation was launched in 2011, as I mentioned, that's when the system first went online. And the initial satellites have a lifetime of 12 years. Now they're trying to improve it to bring a new satellites in which have more capabilities and have a slightly longer uh, lifetime. It costs around 1.4 billion euros to develop this system. Um, and the total cost for development and launch has been around 10 billion. So all of these are very, very expensive. Obviously they give the European Union a, a significant geopolitical advantage, but without the money to develop these systems and test them and all that, it's not really gonna happen. So Galileo and EGNOS are very important systems uh, for the European Union for different uh, reasons. Um, and these are some of the applications where they're, they're used for, right? So think about timing. Having satellite navigation signals can help with authentication, resilience, um, availability, more, ac uh, more accurate timing, um, um, <clears throat> as well as in terms of uh, safety and rescue, being able to actually have accurate services, right? So I think this is, this should be quite clear, I guess, or, or obvious for, for some of you, especially those who are, have a science background. But the Galileo system has been very important for the European Union. And Galileo in 
addition to EGNOS, so the satellite navigation system, as well as the satellite based augmentation system work together um, to improve availability in, in multiple domains. So in, in mobility and vehicles in uh, agriculture in survey in mar maritime and rail navigation signals are very important and can help improve um, accuracy, integrity, um, and things like that. I think that should be relatively clear. So that's the whole satellite navigation part of the European space program, so Galileo and EGNOS. And then there's Copernicus, which is all about European, uh, which is all about Earth observation. So previously known as the Global Monitoring for Environmental Security, this is the European Union's Earth Observation Program. So those who know GMS, so that's Global Monitoring for Environmental Security, this will become more relevant when we think about EU Africa cooperation. Um, so Copernicus is um, producing a lot of data also on a free, full and open access basis. So anybody around the world can have access to Copernicus data and use it freely, fully, and without any problems at all. And that's a very big, um, that's actually very big because not many uh, earth observation systems are like this. And this is also a very important for Africa. We'll get to a bit later because Africans have access to this data as well. And the way satellites work, Africa's in the same channel, the same bands. So they can actually benefit quite, uh, quite significantly from Copernicus data. Same for Galileo, actually, it's the same, uh, same system. So in this case, the European Commission manages the program. It's implemented um, in partnership with member states who also own the, the EU owns the Copernicus system. And then it's implemented by UMITSAT, so the uh, European Organization for Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, as well as other players, such as the e, uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, EU agencies, Mercator, a lot of different players who are all involved in Copernicus. And the idea of it is just basically to get a lot of global data from satellites and also ground-based systems, airborne systems, seaborne systems, to provide uh, information that can help service providers, public authorities, and other international uh, organizations along many different application areas. Um, and yeah, the main objectives for Copernicus International Corporation is really about its full free open data. So it's really trying to get a lot of people to use Copernicus um, which will help obviously strengthen the European markets and strengthen European influence in other countries. We can talk about this when we get to the EU Africa Corporation. Copernicus is made up of uh, how many satellites? One, two, three, four, seven different satellites. So you have Sentinel one, two, three, and five, and then six. Uh, it's going to be a two part slide, but essentially, each, sat each Sentinel satellite is useful for different. Um, different frequencies and different applications, right? So Sentinel-1 is really about being able to see through clouds and rain. Um, so it's radar imaging. Sentinel-2 is um, optical. Sentinel-3 is um, really for sea surface topography. Uh, I think it's right from 300 meters. And Sentinel-5 is really about, so 5P is more about atmospheric, um, calculated atmospheric data. So Sentinel-1, 2, 3, and 6 are dedicated satellites and 4 and 5 are really about Imitsat's weather satellites. So these are the second ones, Sentinel 5P, 4, 5, and 6. They each have different uh, equipment on it. They're run by different people. For the most part, Airbus is Airbus Defense and Space manufactured all the different Sentinel satellites. Um, but yeah, they all have different, different application areas. And these satellites come together to provide six main services. So you have your atmosphere monitoring service, CAMS, Marine Environment Monitoring Service, CMEMS, CLMS, so that's land monitoring, uh, climate change uh, service, uh, service for security applications and emergency management service. So these are the six thematic areas of Copernicus services. Um, and like I said, free, for, free open data, so anybody can use it. The main users are policymakers and public authorities currently who need the information to develop environmental legislation, for example, or policies, um, but you also have private citizens and space companies who are actually using the data, data themselves to create space enabled companies to address uh, different issues within the European Union. Aside from that, you also have um, different cloud based products. So to, to make the data accessible for everybody, essentially, we have what's called the DS, the five data and information access services platforms. And these are platforms that essentially make the data easier to access. Um, they allow you to manipulate, download the data quite easily. And these are very important um, services that without which it'll be very hard to use Copernicus data, essentially, right? 
then just to quickly look a bit at um, how Copernicus is being used globally, you can see that Copernicus is really a big tool of economic diplomacy for the uh, Union. So you have African, especially Australia, US, India, all of these countries are essentially have cooperation agreements with EU regarding Copernicus. Then we have um, GovSatcom. As I mentioned, GovSatcom secure communication for security applications. So this is a very new, uh, one of the new um, priorities that was listed by the EU, uh, EU. So in a highly fragmented landscape with telecommunication services being offered by national and commercial satellite infrastructures, government satellite communication needs to have its own system essentially, because otherwise it's dependent on public uh, channels, which can be hacked, which can be targeted by um, different actors, essentially. So to mitigate the exposure that the European Union has to threats from third parties, they are trying to develop um, a secure and cost efficient communication capabilities, right? Safety critical, so that's a safety, safety critical aspects like key infrastructures and surveillance can be uh, run independently. And so here you have OISPA coordinating the user related aspects, ESA, R&D, use of the European Defense Agency. So that's the military side coming in, the European Union External Action Service and the member states thinking about funding and policy and the European Commission being the overall, um, overall program manager. Give you a few seconds just to, in case you wanna read what is on the slide. Then that brings us to SSA. So this is the other new aspect. So Europe is acquiring the capability to watch and track objects and phenomena in orbits. So this is something that's actually becoming significantly more important these days. So everybody, there's a big hype around space debris and the impact on space debris on the earth. But not only that, there are, you know, asteroids, possible asteroid impacts, as well as effects of space weather. So like um, solar flares, changes in the uh, interpla uh, interplanetary environment, changes in our atmosphere, magnetosphere, all of these have impacts on not only satellites, but also a lot of the activity you want to do in space. And that's now become something that's very, very important. And to illustrate why, you know, ESA did a nice little campaign. These are, so if you look around the earth, these bars are showing you how many satellites were launched every year. And as you can see, it's beyond exponential now, right? The last four years have seen a dramatic increase in the number of satellites uh, driven by the, the, the development of CubeSats. The development of satellites that are very small and that are cheaper to launch has led to an explosion uh, in this, right? And not only is it um, just commercial missions and non-commercial missions, sometimes people, uh, companies will launch things without actually officially registering it, creating new objects that are in space. So now what you have in space is you have a, a lot of satellites that have been launched. So every satellite that's been launched in history is, pro is pretty much still in orbit. Right, so you have 2,000, around close to 3,000 defunct satellites. You have rocket stages. So when the rocket goes up, it, it usually has multiple stages, three to four stages. And at each point, you know, a stage drops out and then the booster keeps going. So all of those discarded stages are still in space. You have uh, debris fragments so that can be dust or different uh, atmospheric, like space particles and space bodies. Or it can be other satellites in space itself, or it can be asteroids coming in. It's, Space, we, we like to think of space as an empty a vacuum and all that, but there's actually a lot of dirt, dust, particles, rocks, broken fragments from um, galactic formation that are still in space. It's actually a busy environment. And these things are traveling at many, many kilometers per second, which make them quite dangerous. Even something that's very small can, um, can greatly impact a satellite if it moves fast enough, right? And more than that, the cost of avoiding collisions is also quite expensive, right? So for a satellite that's in space, typically a satellite has different uh, sensors on it, right? So it's monitoring the environment to see, okay, am I in my right orbit? Am I going on the right path? If it sees something that's coming towards it, it calculates, so it, it analyzes this, okay, there's an object coming close to me at this speed, what's the likelihood that we're gonna actually co collide? Or what's the likelihood that it's gonna come close enough to me that it'll be problematic if there was some sort of impact? And so depending, so they do, a, they run a bit of an analysis to see, okay, What's the point of impact? How much would it cost for me to move out of the way? And that allows the satellite then also to use a bit of fuel to avoid um, avoid any potential collisions. But that's that's an expensive maneuver, right? So that because you're actually spending fuel to move yourself, and a satellite typically has a limited amount of fuel once it's in space, 
And so every conjunction event, every movement decreases the orbital lifetime of the satellite, as well as increases the cost of the mission because it also takes ground data and ground, um, uh, ground efforts to actually monitor all of this. So the more satellites that are in space or the more objects that are in space, the, the harder it is to run space missions, the more expensive it gets, the more potential of space debris, without even thinking about the effects of space weather and the effects of asteroid collisions as well. These are all different things that you need to think about when you're in orbit. And so the, uh, the European Union has decided, okay, we need to have a dedicated, um, dedicated system that thinks about these and that works to mitigate these potential collisions and potential effects. And a big part of that was driven by the European Space Agency. And this is actually a project that I worked um, quite a bit on, which was determining the socioeconomic benefits of having a clean space program. So the clean space program is about saving orbits, right? So they're um, essentially space debris and, and hazardous chemicals, they all, they all pose significant threats to the sustainability of the space industry. And the vast majority of the space debris is in commercially exploitable areas of space. So it's in low earth orbit primarily, and there's a lot of medium earth orbit as well, which are two very popular orbital destinations for most of what we're trying to do. And debris of all sizes can cause significant damages because they're moving very fast, right? And so in terms of how much debris is cataloged, we've cataloged about 22,300 pieces of debris. That's just how much we've cataloged, right? There's even more out there that we haven't even cataloged or tracked or that weren't tracking actively. Right? And there's over 750,000 pieces of debris larger than one centimeter. So that sort of illustrates a bit of the, the size of the challenge that's ahead of us because any of those pieces of debris can cause great devastation to any satellite. And if it hits a satellite and damages the satellite, the satellite can move off orbit and hit other satellites and hit other satellites. And you get this cascading effect where suddenly all of the satellites in orbit are now under risk of being destroyed. So what ESA is trying to do is come up with different ways to mitigate that, right? And that's one, by having satellites that go into Earth orbit now, having different kind of uh, deorbits and different, uh, so basically having different components that allow them to be deorbited after the end of their life, which means that they'll essentially fire themselves into orbit or closer to Earth and then burn up in our atmosphere. They're also developing tools or different components that can like go into space and grab dead satellites and move them out of orbit and different ideas that are coming about. And that's a big initiative from uh, European Space Agency right now. So space situation awareness is becoming a very hot topic right now, and it will continue to become, it will continue to remain important the more satellites we launch into space. And then the last point here uh, for the European space programs or European space capabilities is access to space. So independent access to space is something that's also very important, as we mentioned before, and it's really about uh, making sure that you're not dependent on another country to get your satellites into space. Why is that important? If Europe had a very important, let's say, military satellite, that it wanted to launch into space, if it didn't have its own independent launchers, it would have to go and ask um, Europe, uh, US launchers, uh, US launching systems or Russia launching systems to allow them to put their payload on the launcher. And now they see that's a very, that's, that's a big conflict of interest there. And it's not something, you, it's not a position you wanna be in. So the European Union has two big main launchers, the Ariane launcher launched by the French or developed by the French uh, airspace, um, French space agency along with Ariane Space. And then it also has the Italian version, the Vega launcher. Uh, both are quite expensive. Vega launchers are more for small payloads. Ariane launchers more for heavy payloads. And they both launch from the Guiana Space Center. There's also the Soyuz. So the Soyuz was a, a Russian rocket that is now basically owned by the European, or owned, I think, or worked in tandem with the European Union. Um, but yeah, because of that, they have independent access to space. They can launch any uh, satellites they want, whenever they want. And that uh, strengthens the Union as a whole. So I've been talking quite a lot. Um, so that was basically the end of the European satellite systems. We'll tackle some questions and then we'll get into the last part of this, uh, this presentation, which is about EU Africa cooperation. Um, so first question, isn't it conflicting for a nation to, um, to be a part of the two organizations, OISPA and ESA? No. So even though OESPA and ESA are two separate entities, OESPA is EU, ESA is EU plus other nations, it's not, it's not a conflict of interest because these two, OESPA and ESA work together very, very closely on all the space programs. So OESPA and ESA work together on Galileo. They work together on Copernicus. They work together um, on every, everything we've seen before, they work together. So these are two organizations that are actually very closely related, very um, they coordinated and work together on a lot of things. And so because of that, you have members of OISPA and members of ESA. It's just the only difference is that ESA has 
non-EU members as well and has its own independent governmental structure. And it does not, it does not uh, respond or it's not a, um, what's it called? Um, it does not have to basically listen to anything the EU has to say. It can operate completely independently. But because they operate, they coordinate and they work together on everything, there is no actual conflict of interest. It just makes things much more complicated to talk about and to organize and to manage. And yeah. <laughs> then, what is the role of Umitsat in the GovSatcom project? So let's go back to GovSatcom. So yeah, Umitsat is actually not a part of GovSatcom. So Umitsat is a part of um, the uh, Copernicus program. So that's over here. So Copernicus, Emitad is one of the leading institutions, one of the interested, interested entities for the Copernicus program. So they really manage a lot of things. They operate a lot of things independently and sort of the main uh, player outside of ESA and European Commission that's part of Copernicus, but they're not a part of the GovSatcom. So GovSatcom is a new initiative, which has more of the defense elements. So you have more of the military, the European Defense Agency, European External Action Service, and OISPA and ESA working together. Then when was uh, Galileo discovered and is it limited to EU countries or is it open? So Galileo wasn't discovered. So Galileo is a space program that is focused on satellite navigation, right? What does that mean? So it means that the European Union launched, I think 12 satellites, 12 massive satellites that look sort of like this which provide navigation signals for the European Union or generally for the world, but it's focused is uh, to provide it specifically for the European Union, right? However, the data from Galileo can be used by anybody across the world, but for free. So similar to GPS, even if you're in Africa, you can use GPS. If you're in Africa, you can use Galileo as well. So the Galileo signals are global. Um, yeah, Galileo signals are global and can be used by anybody in the world. It's not limited uh, to only EU, but it's run by the EU. So Russia has its own GLONASS, uh, US has its own uh, GPS, China has its own Beidou, uh, and yeah, and so yeah, the EU has its own uh, Galileo. Then, do, 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 do. back to the questions. Uh, so the question is what, sorry, you meant it is that. Uh, so what role does it is that, um, have um, for GovSatcom, I assume then is the question. It is that, um and Intelsat are essentially, so what's on all, Intelsat and Intelsat are essentially operators of satellite communication systems. Um, in this case, GovSatcom is really, trying to create an independent system, so independent from private commercial entities, right? So th the aim of it is essentially, so I mean, a lot of it is still being defined right now, essentially, it's not quite um, clear what exactly it's gonna be, but essentially you can think of satellite communication as two types, there's military satellite communication and there's commercial satellite communication. Under commercial satellite communication is where you have your Intelsats, your Ultrasats, who, are, who have their big satellites in geostationary orbits and are providing broadband and different communication service. And you have your military satcom, which has its own private satellites that you probably haven't heard of. And now they're trying to create one in between, Gulf satcom, which is really focused on European public safety, European uh, public institutions to allow them to talk between each other. How that's gonna be actually developed and how it's gonna be set up, not quite clear, but Intersat and Intersat are currently not a part of the plans, right? So. This is sort of a new initiative that they're trying to build over the next like 20 to 30 years um, to ensure that Europe has its own dedicated, secure, private communications. So that's still being developed. It will probably develop more of the military side rather than the commercial side. So that is bringing us to our final chapter. EU motivation for international cooperation. So we've touched upon this a uh, few times throughout this entire talk. Um, Main thing is really economic diplomacy. So promoting their own standards, increasing the adoption of their own components, uh, maintaining and improving geopolitical, geopolitical power, identifying potential market ab abroad. EU wants to foster a, a solid and indu balanced industrial base to ensure greater international competitiveness and to open new markets for space products and services. 
So we talked about Galileo, Egnos, Copernicus, all of those things are systems and programs that it wants other nations to start using because it makes those other nations dependent on European infrastructure. This is especially important in countering to China, which has emerged obviously as one of Africa's uh, more closer partners in the recent history. Um, and of course the US has always been quite involved in, or is trying to be more involved in Africa as well. They recently doubled, to, doubled their investment budget to 60 billion and are trying to do more. So now there's basically a scramble for Africa as it's always been. Now you have China, US uh, and Europe all trying to get into Africa, all trying to make partnerships within Africa and become the more dominant uh, player on the continent obviously because that helps them also geopolitically with their own strategies and their own plans. Africa EU cooperation has involved a lot of different actors and it's been actually going on for quite some time already. So dating back to the first few policies as we, as we saw at the very start, African cooperation was always a big part of the EU's plan. European Commission is really the coordinator and the financier behind it, although the European Space Agency does the same. Ermitsad has their own individual projects uh, individual member states have their own bilateral projects. So Germany and France um, have their, their own. Um, and then EASC, so the European Association of Remote Sensing uh, Communities also um, recently was involved with uh, AARC as well, AARC. The flagship component of the flagship uh, vehicle that we know is GMS in Africa. So the Global Monitoring for Environmental Security in Africa. So this program uh, essentially is about the use of Earth observation data for sustainable development in Africa. So it's called GMS in Africa because GMS was the old name for Copernicus. So what you can think about is essentially the use of Copernicus within Africa for three main thematic areas. So long-term management of natural resources, marine and, uh, management of marine and coastal areas, as well as water resources management. So there are 13 main consortia who are all working on this right now. So based in Egypt, Gabon, Ghana, Kenya, Mauritius, uh, Namibia, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, Tunisia, and the DRC. So the GMS in Africa program covers the entire continent, um, unlike its predecessor. So before GMS in Africa, there were a few other Earth observation programs for Africa, but they were mostly focused on North Africa. Um, so, and now the GMS in Africa tries to cover the entire continent. Five key areas that are trying to do so, improve access to Earth observation data, focus on two main services. So water and natural resources, as well as marine and coastal environments. Um, and also work on capacity building and awareness raising for Earth observation. Um, so these are, GMS in Africa is still quite an early program, so only two services are in place. Initially, they had come up with nine thematic areas and nine services um, covering things like, um, yeah, just, just different types of resource management as well. But they decided to start off with water, not water, natural resources, and marine and coastal environments, essentially. For example, so um, I actually had the pleasure of working with um, some of the GMS in Africa consortia on a communications workshop. And so there we talked to different players. So Marco South, that's in South Africa. That's a consortium, uh, the organization out in South Africa that's working on marine and coastal. So they have come up with different applications using uh, Copernicus data, essentially, in, in partnership with Mercator or ECMWF or Imitsat using different Copernicus satellites for things like marine weather forecast, ship traffic monitoring, coastal ecosystem ma mapping, monitoring assessment, and different areas, right? Similarly, in Ghana, you have the University of Ghana, which is the implementing body in Ghana, uh, working with the Ghana Meteorological Agency um, to develop a way to essentially uh, inform fishermen of um, weather conditions on, on water, essentially ocean weather conditions. So they can, before they go out, they can just on their phone using a USS decode. So they don't even need internet. Uh, they can find out what is the current condition on the water? Should I be going out? What should I be wearing, watching, up, um, watching out for? Is there a storm coming? So these are very concrete applications of using satellite data that are now being implemented regionally within Africa by the different institutions. And uh, like I said, I was in, in Addis Ababa actually a year ago. Was it a year ago? Yeah, a year ago in March with members from the GMES and Africa Consortium. You can see my smiling face back here, uh, where we actually worked with them to try and improve some of the communication aspects. And it was actually very cool and very fun uh, workshop. Aside from Copernicus, uh, you also have Navigation Corporation within Africa. So we talked a bit about EGNOS. 
So EGNOS is a very interesting system in the sense that it can be and it can be extended to Africa simply by building more ground stations within Africa. So you just develop specific ground stations in Africa and you can now extend the entire EGNOS infrastructure and services to Africa as well, which essentially allows Africans to benefit from the use of uh, satellite-based augmentation systems, which allow them to improve things like air transport and other uh, upstream and downstream applications. Of course, from, a US, from an EU perspective, this is very nice because they can now sell ground stations, receiver equipment, services, infrastructure to Africans now. So they have a way to earn more money as well, um, as well as uh, highlight their use of their navigation systems. This has had a long history. So even since 2004, the EU has been trying their best to um, extend EGNOS services into Africa. Um, mostly, so they, they, they have been mostly focusing on uh, North Africa, uh, French Africa, and South Africa as the main areas of cooperation. Um, and actually the second, so the, the French speaking Africa, so in the West and uh, has, it already has plans to develop their own uh, satellite based augmentation system based on EGNOS as well. So you can see um, Earth observation and uh, navigation. There have been quite a lot of activity between Europe and Africa already. Um, however, on satellite communication or other applications, it really hasn't been the case. In fact, China has been has had way more of an impact than Africa uh, than Europe um, in terms of that cooperation. Overall, uh, the Europe has already has spent quite a lot of money, uh, funded a lot of different programs. Uh, both in Earth observation and satellite navigation through different instruments. Um, but yeah, the GMS in Africa program is probably the most recognizable and the most the flagship program for Africa currently. Yeah, so that covers um, EU Africa cooperation. So that basically rounds off uh, this talk. Before we finish, we'll just fin finalize some last questions. So if you have any questions for this part or for any of the talks so far, now would be the best time to ask them because after this will be done. So concerning the American concern about Galileo GPS frequencies, how long did it take to change the frequencies? So the American and uh, EU fight about Galileo GP GPS frequencies happened before Galileo was actually launched and actually created. Um, so they were able to change the frequencies uh, quickly enough, but I think the, de the deliberation back and forth uh, took a few months uh, to actually resolve that issue because um, it, it was a long and heated discussion as well. Um, and so it took a few months before they actually resolved it. But then because the system hadn't been launched, it was quite easy technically to, to solve that. Then what is the potential in Africa for her getting involved in the SSA program of the EU? So SSA, as I mentioned, is a very, very brand, like a brand new field that people are starting to care about these days. So I think it was basically two, three years ago, where it became kind of a priority for the EU to start thinking about it. And um, the problem, the problem with this is like, SSA is not something that is directly, it's not like, it's not something that's directly beneficial, you know, so if Russia launches a satellite, Europe launches a satellite and the US launches a satellite, right, who is responsible to make sure that satellite doesn't crash with another satellite? That already that in itself has a very has a very loaded political question, right? Because whoever decides to avoid the other has to pay the cost of it. So if Russia if Russia if a Russian satellite and a European satellite are on uh, collision course, whoever moves the satellite out of way has to pay a cost of moving it. We saw that moving your satellite costs fuel and costs actual money, right? And and so that in itself is already a, a big political discussion about who does it and it requires a certain cost. Apart from that, if let's say a commercial um, a commercial company launches a satellite, if that satellite hits another satellite, currently nobody uh, is responsible for that, right? No single entity is required to pay for a collision in space because there is no regulatory framework surrounding it. So that's currently something that's being focused on right now. It's trying to build a regulatory framework. Who is responsible for a collision in space? Who has to pay what? How do you have to deorbit it? What are the regulations regarding space as a whole, right? And so these are all things that are being discussed right now and are quite fresh. So from that from that perspective, I mean, African infrastructure and know-how is currently not on the level to be able to do that, right? African doesn't really have 
a um, an independent tracking system, a uh, ground station that can track all the different satellites that's going around. We don't have the deorbiting capability. We don't have the regulatory uh, know-how to be really partaking in any of these conversations. But of course, this is something that will, that will actually impact Africans moving forward. You know, if African, if we now start developing the uh, um, ability and the capability to launch satellites independently, now we have to do, uh, abide by the laws of the current uh, space agencies who are defining the regulatory framework and landscape for space mitigation. So actually, I think it's quite important for Africans to be part of this discussion because any um, decisions made will affect African access to space. But unfortunately, I think currently we do not have the, the know-how, the infrastructure, or the political, political cloud to even be a part of the conversation. But indeed, that is something that is, is quite relevant for Africa. Um, and so I think we should be paying attention to what, what gets decided or what gets developed over the next, uh, over the next few years. Does Africa have uh, its potential to develop its own augmentation system considering the EGNOS experience? Yeah, so that's actually something um, that's been a big discussion. So, I mean, we talked about how there've been previous projects dedicated to uh, expanding EGNOS within Africa. Part of why that hasn't gone as far as it should have, or maybe hasn't uh, really uh, picked up momentum is because that there was a, um, a proposal to develop an African SBAS. So um, an African satellite-based um, augmentation system was something that was also a priority for a lot of African countries because they realized, look, we don't want ourselves to now be dependent on European space infrastructure. You know, Europe is trying not to be dependent on others. Why should we be dependent on them? So there were some talks and there were some uh, discussions about developing an independent African satellite-based augmentation system. The closest that comes to it is the ASECNA system um, which is a SBAS system. It's still based on EGNOS, um, but it's, it's meant to be more independent than purely an EGNOS system. Do we have the potential to develop our own? Yes. So developing an augmentation system is not as difficult as developing a satellite navigation constellation because the augmentation system is, really requires you to develop ground-based infrastructure. So for Africa to develop its own system, it would first need to develop the right ground-based infrastructure to allow to leverage things like EGNOS and other um, SPAS, and then in the longer term, you can think about developing the actual satellites in space as well, which will also help the, the navigation um, augmentation. So does it have this potential? Yes. Of course, that costs a lot of money, and that has a lot of other coordination problems. You know, you have to get all the African states, nations to work together to actually fund it and manage it and all that. In terms of what's easier, it would be significantly easier to just leverage EGNOS for the time being. In terms of what's better geopolitically or in terms of what's better for it, keeping Africa independent, it would be of course nicer to have um, our own augmentation system. So if you are interested in the European space sector, this is another study that I worked on. Um, this looks specifically at uh, the funding landscape. So we didn't touch upon funding too deeply here or some of the other space programs, obviously because of no time. If you're interested in the funding, this is a very uh, big study by the European Investment Bank, the future of the European space sector which I worked on, uh, which looks into the funding landscape. Other than that, thank you all for listening. My name is Kweku. I hope you learned something. This is, definitely took a bit longer. I think I added an extra hour to this, uh, this talk at him, but I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that you guys uh, stuck with me um, and I hope you found it informative. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think it's it just about 30 minutes extra, but which was quite a typical class, a typical university lecture. It's usually about two hours. So this is, this is also <laughs> good. Uh, so I do, it, because your very last slide, the, the work you did with uh, EIB, the European mm -hmm. Investment Bank, I think just this morning, I was reading an article where people have been talking about uh, uh, the, the, the private space sector in Europe. It's not as vibrant as uh, as the US, and the a lot of people have been trying to see how the EIB can uh, can kind of fold, can support the private space industry. I don't know. Is, is that an, uh, an an offshoot or an outcome of the work you did? Yeah. So essentially. Um... Europe is always very nervous about the U.S. and about uh, so about the U.S. specifically. The U.S. has the largest and the best industry, and Europe, in that sense, feels inferior to it and is trying to figure out how can we catch up to them. A big difference between the European and U.S. is how much money 
is spent in the US on space versus how much is spent in Europe on space. And so that was, that was the initial boost between why did they create the study? They want to understand what does the funding landscape look like within Europe? Actually, I even have a, let me quickly uh, share my screen again. Uh, just to show, cause I have a, an annex onto an annex of, where is it, where is it, where is it? Show all windows. Uh, this yeah. Right. This is this this slide here is essentially a picture of all the all the funding instruments within uh, Europe. So in Europe, what they do is that they rely a lot on public funding. So the left hand side of the slide with the big uh, balls, these are all public funding instruments that are used for space technologies and for space ideas, space business, space applications. If you look at this compared to the VC, so on the right hand side is like the venture capital. The venture capital is significantly smaller in size than the public funding. This is very different from the US, where in the US, venture capital and private funding is significantly, like orders of magnitude larger than any kind of public funding. And that is the discrepancy between Europe and US. So Europe has a lot of public funding brought by the ESA, brought by European Commission. But they were wondering how can we catch up to the European, the US ecosystem? Because the US ecosystem just has funding numbers that are completely dwarf anything in Europe. So that's where the conversation start, started. Like, okay, first let's look at the European ecosystem. What kind of funding instruments do we have? How does it work? Is it actually useful? And then from there, what other instruments and what other things can we build to continue to improve the um, European ecosystem to ensure that um, European companies and European ideas can become more successful and so the industry as a whole can actually compete against the US. So that, so that study that we did was sort of the precursor to now this whole talk about, okay, how can we improve the funding landscape to ensure that European companies and ideas um, can be developed further? Yeah, so, sorry, a follow-up question. Since it's the e e Europe has public funded, which is supposedly more than private funded, so what's the problem here? Is it the amount? Is it that it's small? Or is it where they are putting the money? I mean, where, where they are channeling the money? It's both um, the amount and the stage of the cycle, right? So European, European funding comes at the very beginning of a, of a company's life cycle. So when you have an idea, there's a lot of instruments and a lot of uh, things like the European Business Incubation Center, which help you get an initial idea into a prototype. So there's a lot of funding for that initial idea to prototype stage, business plan stage. But once you've got the prototype, there's not much money for actually to actually grow the idea and grow the company. While in the US, that's where the US is, that's where the, a lot of the money comes in. It's like from here to growing the company, that's where all the venture capital money comes in. And they have so much money there that those companies can lift off the ground and actually become big companies. But that's not the case in Europe. Europe will help you at the very start, but after the very start, it's up to you, which is a big problem for space because a lot of space programs and other space companies and ideas need a lot of money to actually grow. So for example, if you want to build a rocket launcher, you need millions and, and close to billions of, of dollars, right? And that's, you're not going to get that from a public funding. You can only really get that from private uh, money. Well, thank you. Because that, 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 your, your answer actually explains why the, uh, when the, the formerly called GSA, the European Space Agency, now called the USPA, they used to have this competition of satellite navigation. So there's money at the beginning, like you said, but after you get to the prototype, they're scaling up, it's a problem. Exactly, yeah. So the, the Europe is very, they have a lot of these like competitions, challenges, contests, business incubation. All of that is really for the initial stage to help you get started, to help you get going. But after that, that's the main issue. There is no follow-up funding after that stage. And so a lot of European companies actually end up moving to the US because that's where the money is at. And that's been a big problem for the Europe and that's what they're trying to fix right now. Well, thank you so, so much. We, we can't thank you enough. So, and uh, thanks to everybody who, who was able to hang around. Uh, we hope to have you again some other time. I don't know what else you come and talk to us about, but really appreciate your time and effort you put in this. Uh, so, hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you.